Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I was delighted to be asked to be the um, the lay reader today because to to read what is the first writing in the oldest book of the New Testament is kind of a thrill for me. I also have to tell you, I, I, I really like the book of Mark. It's the oldest one. It's the shortest gospel. And um, apparently, although you never can re be really sure because two scholars, three opinions, but some scholars believe that the gospel of Mark was, um, was assembled at, in Rome, composed in Rome as a summary of Peter's preaching. However, there are other scholars who'll say there's absolutely no first century proof. So like so much of seminary, you know, you have to figure out your own, what you believe. Um, what else? Um, I do recommend reading it all at one go. We did this in seminary and it really gives you a sense of the excitement of this early story and the confusion as well of the early days. So let us listen for the word of God. In the, begin, uh, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, see, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with a water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts and the angels waited on him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately, they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called to them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Here ends the reading. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Diana. Thank you for that reading. And uh, thank you for um, uh, sharing uh, beforehand. Um, and I hope that this sermon, yeah, you touched on some of the things that the sermon will touch on as well, which is great. Good. Good. I didn't uh, mean to steal your thunder. No, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> uh, friends, will you pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my lips May the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Amen. So like Diana, the gospel of Mark has a special place in my heart. Not because it is my favorite gospel, and that would be the gospel of Luke, but because it's the only gospel that I have personally translated portions of from the Hellenistic Greek. 
I did this during a class called Rapid Reading, which was one of my favorite classes. It was for students who had completed three semesters of Greek, and it was pass-fail with no tests, no papers, no formal evaluation. Each week, you translate 10 verses from the Gospel of Mark on your own. Then the class would meet and share and correct our translations because we weren't that great at this. And then we would work together on the next several verses until the end of class time. And wherever we stopped, that's where we'd pick up and translate the next 10 verses. Wash, rinse, repeat. Do the work and participate, then you pass. The reason we worked with the Gospel of Mark was twofold. First, it's less challenging Greek than the other three Gospels. But another really important factor was that in the Gospel of Mark, you can translate 10 verses and get from the beginning of the good news to John the Baptist and the baptism of Jesus. And in the next 10 verses, you get Jesus being tempted in the desert and beginning his ministry in Galilee and calling his first disciples. If you translate 10 verses of Matthew, Jesus isn't even born yet. You'd still be working your way uh, through that super fun genealogy at the beginning of Matthew. So Mark doesn't mess around. He gets right to the point. There are no extra details. There aren't even like some important details. Where did Jesus come from? But you can read 10 lines and cover a lot of ground. And that's not just something that's good for Greek students who are fumbling their way through a translation. It was good for the scribes that had to copy these by hand and the readers who read them aloud. Mark is so short that people used to think that it was the abridged version of Matthew. You know, after all, 99% of the Gospel of Mark is found nearly verbatim in the Gospel of Matthew. But Mark is not the shorter version of Matthew. Mark is actually older and the first gospel written. Matthew should be called the longer version of Mark. In fact, Mark was an important source not only for the gospel of Matthew, but also the gospel of Luke. See, they, they both had copies of Mark that they used in putting, putting together their respective gospels. They also had a collection of sayings, like this, um, this collection of sayings that's found in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew that we call Q, which means an unknown source. We know it existed. We have a good idea of what it said because it's found in both Matthew and Luke, but independent copies of Q were never preserved and didn't stand the test of time. Mark did, not just by being included in Matthew and in Luke, but on its own. And I believe it survived due to the power of the Holy Spirit and the way that God has her hands, uh, even in these messy affairs of copies and translations and canonization. But we shouldn't discount the fact that Mark survived for the same reason that many animals survive. It was fast. He kept things simple and brief. He told the st story in a hurry, like, some, like someone with something amazing to get off of their chest. I mean, Jesus goes to the desert for 40 days and is tempted by Satan and angels wait on him and it gets two sentences. Two sentences. I want to know more. Thankfully, Luke devotes 13 verses to the story. Uh, but that's a lot more ink, a lot more effort to copy, a lot more paper to find. Because, you know, when most people think of ancient texts, they think of fancy scrolls with perfect calli calligraphy from devoted priests or those illuminated manuscripts from the Middle Ages that are just stunningly beautiful. But those aren't our earliest sources for the gospel. No, the oldest sources are just fragments, broken up pieces of papyrus. They come from things called codices, which are little booklets made of animal skin or papyrus. Papyrus was cheaper to make and to share. So instead of having a uh, scroll living in a library in some faraway land, your small Christian community could have a papyrus codex. You weren't going to have hundreds of them, but you could get your hands on one. And these were no frills pieces of paper sewn together into a pamphlet. And the writing doesn't follow the common conventions that we use today. There's no punctuation, 
no lowercase letters, no margins or indentation, no chapters and verses, those came later. There aren't even spaces between the words, just wall to wall, all capital letter, Greek letters, from margin to margin, from edge of the page to the edge of the page. So it's not just the language of the Gospels that separate them from our pew Bibles. It's the formatting and the style. And most importantly, it's the context and the expectation of these texts. Diana mentioned that uh, it, many scholars believe that this was written in Rome to a uh, Greek-speaking Christian community that were not that was non-Jewish. Um, and even though Marcus considered what a biography would be back then, that's not the kind of biography that we would expect today. You know, Mark was written to be shared in this unique system of the time. And it was written to those non-Jewish converts to Christianity to strengthen their faith and teach them more about the life, ministry, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. These weren't missionary tracts that were written to try to win converts. The Gospel of Mark was used much like we use it today for Christians to read devotionally in worship, to learn, discuss, and grow in God's word. You know, language and writing may have changed a lot in 2,000 years, but Christian communities gathered in worship for a gospel message, that hasn't changed. And that's the good news this morning. We are gathered on a Sunday morning, much like the first Christians. And we are reading from the same text 2,000 years later. Like them, we are pondering its meaning for our lives, our relationships, and the future of our world. Today's reading starts out, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. And we are still reading and sharing that good news across the generations. This is due to the power of Christ's message and ministry. This is due to the perseverance of Christian saints throughout the ages. This is due to the miracle of those fishermen answering the call of Jesus, getting out of their boats and becoming fishers of men. These illiterate Galileans went on to start the largest religious movement in the history of the world. I believe they did it because God was with them and they spoke the truth. But I also believe that it's because Mark may be old, but it's fast. We've got an account of the good news that can be easily shared, easily read, easily studied with thousands of divinity students stumbling over the Greek every year. It inspired Luke and Matthew to write more, to capture more of the story of Jesus Christ. And we are going to be reading from this gem of the gospel for the next three months. We aren't going to read every single word. Mark is short, but it's not that short. But I do think it's a good idea, as Diana mentioned, to try to read it in one go. Or at the very least, read the parts that we are skipping, it won't take much effort to fill in the, those blanks. You know, I'm excited about the journey ahead. You know, next week, I, I'm preaching on one of my favorite parables, the, the parable of the mustard seed. But right now, this morning, I'm just grateful. I'm grateful Mark told this story, that the story survived, that what we're doing now is so similar to what our fellow believers did back then. You know, sure, we're gathered in our homes during a snowstorm over the internet, aided by electronics that are unimaginable to first century believers. But, but the basics, gathering on a Sunday morning, the day of the resurrection, for worship and to hear God's word, to let it enter and change our lives, that's the same. Different languages, different technologies, but one spirit one body, and one Lord in Jesus Christ, God's beloved Son, in whom we are all well pleased. Thanks be to God, and amen.